Hi, everybody. I have a very special guest today. I have Dr. Ricardo Duchesne. He is a Canadian historical sociologist and professor at the University of New Brunswick and author of the fantastic book, Canada in Decay, Mass Immigration, Diversity, and the Ethno Side of Euro-Canadians. So welcome, Dr. Duchesne, to my channel. Hi, I'm glad to be talking to you. Uh, it's great. And I want to talk about my book. Perfect. So first and foremost, you are an immigrant yourself to Canada. Yes. Where are you I, from? Puerto Rico. I came in here when I was 15 years old. So I am an immigrant and uh, I've been here for obviously most of my life. I live in Montreal for some 15 years. I live in Toronto for about six. And now since I got my job teaching at the University of New Brunswick, I've been in New Brunswick, St. John, longer than in any other city. So uh, in terms of time and in terms of my, you might say intellectual dedication to Canada, I do think of myself as a Canadian. Okay. It is interesting to me though, as an immigrant yourself, that you chose to tackle this issue uh, predominantly associated with Euro Canadians. So I, I do find that fascinating. Yes, I mean, uh, my intellectual development was from the left slowly into the mainstream right and then into issues of uh, cultural identity and immigration. And so, in that sense, um, I'm not originally a conservative. Uh, my background is very leftist, but I became increasingly dissatisfied with the left. I was seeing uh, a lot of things that didn't make sense to me, that were contradictory. Uh, one of the things that I really objected to when I was doing my PhD and I was still on the left is this emphasis on multiculturalism. I could tell already then as a graduate student that this imply that Canadian culture was like a blank slate upon which other cultures uh, would stamp themselves and would be celebrated. And just by its very nature, it made me uncomfortable. Uh, it made me feel that here is a country that is dedicating itself to other identities, other peoples, and at the same time, because this was all viewing our universities, at the same time, it was really always looking down at Canadian culture, mm -hmm. uh, what the Canadians have done in the past. So I saw there's something wrong here. Uh, I have studied a lot of history all my life, and I can't think of a nation that or a people that would sort of negate itself, uh, negate themselves. Um, so this was unprecedented. I could tell there's something going on here that is new, it's not natural. And so I began to slowly, at first, as I said, I was on the left, uh, but that particular issue, just multiculturalism, made me uncomfortable. And I was also very attracted to the intellectual tradition of Western civilization. I kind of knew that uh, European peoples had achieved a lot. Uh, that in many ways they surpass all other civilizations in the world. My first book, uh, Uniqueness of Western Civilization, is about that, is to try and understand why it is that uh, Western civilization not only uh, brought about modern science and modern industry, but even in terms of its contribution to philosophy, it's unsurpassed. I um, mean, cartography, the Renaissance, painting, art. And so that really is what got me out of the left, that attraction to high achievements. And from there, I began to see that it was not just Canada, but in the United States, in Australia, in Europe, they were pushing the same idea about multiculturalism with slight variations, but it was sort of the same idea. Mm -hmm. And I began to study that and react against it. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. We're definitely seeing this uh, somewhat suicide of our own cultural identity happening. And I wanted to talk to you specifically in your book because you say the entire Canadian political establishment 
the mainstream media and the academics are all in unison with the banks and corporations in promoting two myths in, uh, specifically to justify mass immigration. Could you elaborate on what those two myths are? Yes. Uh, well, first, at first, when I was moving out of the left, I began to get attracted to the conservative viewpoint. But as I studied immigration, and I could see during the Harper years that the conservatives were pushing for immigration like no one had ever done before, mm -hmm. I started realizing that the left and the right are together on this fundamental question. But, oh, yeah, you asked about the, the two myths. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the two myths about um, is that we, we believe that Canada, and I addressed this right away in the beginning, we believe that Canada was founded by uh, diverse immigrants. And one of the things I do, and this is the book, I'll just show you in case uh, people haven't seen it. I don't know if you can see it there. So we believe that Canada has been founded by diverse immigrants. And I argue that that is not the case, that Canada actually was founded by Euro-Canadians. Uh, we know it was founded by first the English and then the Quebecois. And if you look at statistics on birth rates and the number of immigrants that came to Canada, just take the example of the Quebecois, from, uh, say, the early 1600s, up until 1763, when the British conquered uh, Quebec, um, something like 10% to 12% of the population came as immigrants. Uh, the rest were born in Canada. And the reason for that is that the Quebecois had a very high fertility rate, five point something per women. And so that is really uh, uh, a very high fertility rate. And it means that we are talking about a people that were created right in the soil of Canada. Right. There are no Quebecois anywhere else. I mean, when people say, oh, they're all immigrants, you all came from somewhere else. Uh, I don't see anywhere else a people with this identity, the Quebecois. I mean, obviously they're connected to the French, but um, they are also very peculiar with their own accent. They have other attributes that are very different from uh, what you find in France. So, um, that was the first myth that Canada is not really a, a, a nation of immigrants. And I demonstrate this in great detail. Sorry, just to interrupt you for a second, um, because this is a myth that we hear quite often, that our nation was founded by an array of immigrants. But the truth is there is a huge difference between an immigrant and a settler or a pioneer. But they don't seem to make that distinction. Right. I, uh, I have a section in the book in which I address uh, the three words, pioneer, settler, and immigrant. Mm -hmm. And I kind of argue that the people who first came from Europe could be defined as pioneers. Pioneers means that you are the first. You're pioneering something that someone else hasn't done before. Uh, a new lifestyle, new technologies to adapt to the uh, temperature climate in Canada. Settler means that you're settling the land. The land is still in the wild. Uh, you're creating farms and you really are creating the whole infrastructure and modern technologies that we associate with a modern nation. Uh, immigrant means, you, and these are dictionary definitions. You, you know, I, I read various dictionaries and I look for those definitions. And immigrant means that you arrive to a place that's already settled, mm -hmm. uh, that has already been created. So I kind of argue that, strictly speaking, if we follow these definitions, um, immigrants began to arrive to Canada somewhere around the late 19th to early 20th century. Uh, that would be an appropriate, um, uh, the word immigrant would be appropriately used to describe that period of immigration. Okay, and your second point that you had made regarding the myth, you had said immigration enriches the country and you believe this to be a myth. Can you explain why? Well, I mean, it depends. Like, we, if we are talking about the pioneers and the settlers, obviously you need them to create a nation. And as I just said, many of them were born right here in Canada. Uh, but it is a myth or it is an assumption that hasn't yet been fully examined, which is that the more diversity you have, somehow we are told the better the nation becomes. 
but there is no evidence of that. We have no proof of that. Uh, that's why in the very beginning, and I use the words of Pierre Trudeau, uh, what is transpiring in Canada and has been transpiring for the last few decades, and these are, I'm quoting Pierre Trudeau, is an experiment of major proportions. Mm -hmm. uh, he used these words very early in the 1960s, and he wasn't envisioning at that time full-scale immigration and open borders. He was sort of envisioning a Canada that would be uh, multicultural rather than bicultural. So that's what he meant by experiment of major proportions. Uh, he was thinking later on in the 1970s that it would mean opening the borders uh, to people from wider areas of the world, uh, to, from the third world. And so it is really during the Pierre Trudeau years in the 1970s that you see uh, this emphasis on third world immigration. So by then he's kind of envisioning a Canada that would be different, that would no longer be European. And another thing about uh, Pierre Trudeau that I examine closely in this book is that he very distinctly argued that it wasn't simply a question of Quebec nationalism posing a problem to Canadian unity, but it was also Anglo nationalism. And he looked both at Anglo nationalism and Quebecois nationalism and said both of those nationalisms have to go. And not only that, but Canada should not be defined as a bicultural nation because no culture is more important than any other in the case of Canada. All cultures are equal. So even a people that has never been here and starts arriving in Canada automatically would be considered to be just as significant. And in my view, that's just simply historically inaccurate. It kind of shows your mind that is looking to the future. It's saying it will be more important. It should be more important. But my view is, well, yes, obviously in the long term, if you have a nation open to the rest of the world, then other people become important in that nation's identity. But historically, in terms of the ancestry, in terms of the customs, uh, the songs, uh, the way people dress, all those things, is they're not uh, uh, important. The important uh, costumes and cultural uh, things are the things that were provided by the first people who created the nation. Right. Uh, it's when you speak about that, um, it's, it's hurtful to Canadians, I find. Uh, I'm a multi-generational Canadian. I've had uh, family members that have died fighting in wars for the country. And so when I hear something like that, that this is, this is the train of thought of specific individuals, that they believe that you can just come to Canada and therefore you're automatically a Canadian, completely bypassing all of the historical context of people that have lived here for multi-generations and how, or have helped build up the country. It's disturbing, I think, for a lot of people, myself included. Well, one of the things that people don't realize is that um, European peoples are uniquely an individualist people. Uh, liberalism is itself a creation of European peoples. And what liberalism means, in essence, is that you value the identity of each singular individual. Uh, you don't judge people as members of a particular uh, ethnic or religious background, but you try to say, well, even if you're a Protestant or a Catholic, you have the same rights to practice your religions because uh, it's, that, it's your individual choice to decide what you want to believe, and you may want to be secular. Um, but this individualism is unique to Western people, and it's not really a reality in other cultures. So when other people come, what they really more than anything else pick up from Canada is this emphasis on their cultural identity, this emphasis that they have a right to preserve their customs, a right to preserve their way of life. Now, it is true, some of them, um, and I think when they come in smaller numbers, can assimilate to this kind of liberal individualist culture. Well, you're an example of that, right? Right. I, I, I am exa an example of that, you could say, when people arrive in small numbers. But when you have large groups and it's endless, continuous arrival of peoples, uh, and we see this particularly with Islamic immigration, 
uh, what you have really are different ethnic groups expressing their traditional collectivist ways of life and liberalism seems to them something that is alien that they cannot quite relate to but westerners have this idea well just give them one or two generations they'll just become like us mm -hmm. uh, but there are many flaws with that argument because when you say they'll become like us well like what like a canada that is no longer the same like a canada that continues several celebrates other identities um, how much has the educational system changed to accommodate other cultures so of course the, the, there is a sense in which they are assimilating to a multicultural Canada a uh, Canada has a very weak identity and even now Justin Trudeau says uh, Canada that is a post nation it, it doesn't even have a national identity and I talk about this uh, towards the end of the book that this idea of a post-national identity is an extreme expression of a process that began earlier. If you look at Pierre Trudeau, the father of Justin, he at least recognized that Canada was a Western nation, that it had a strong civic Western identity. Uh, Justin is almost saying that even that civic Western identity cannot be emphasized at the cost of kind of marginalizing Islamic identities that may not be Western and other identities that have different ways of organizing themselves that may include Sharia law. So it's kind of moving in that direction that, you know, in the case of Trump, people say he's a civic nationalist. He is in the sense that he says, well, the United States has these liberal values and we need to uphold them really strongly Whereas in the case of Justin Trudeau, he's now saying, well, not quite. That would mean that you're thinking you're better, that your Western background somehow is superior to the background of other peoples. I mean, he's not articulating these ideas. He's just vaguely saying that even that civic identity has to go. Yeah, no, and definitely in all of his actions, he's certainly expressing that sentiment. So I wanted to get back to your book specifically. It also exposes the rewriting of Canadian history in the media schools and university uh, as an attempt to rob almost Euro Canadians of their own history by inventing a past that conforms to the ideological goals of a future multiracial and multicultural Canada. Can you further explain that? Yes. Um if you're going to create a new Canada, then you have to rewrite the past. And what they're doing is that they're rewriting the past in such a way that it seems to be pointing in the direction of the Canada that we see today. So one of the things that I notice is that in textbooks that are being taught to first year university students, and I examine the most widely popular textbooks around, uh, they're saying that Canada was from very early on a diverse multicultural nation. Now, they're in a bit of a dilemma because they don't want to say, oh, well, Canada was always the way it is now. So what they say is that it was in fact, but that white supremacists or racists didn't acknowledge that reality. So what we are doing now is that we are acknowledging a reality that was always there. So they're doing this because they want to make Canadians think that this endless arrival of huge numbers of people is somehow natural, is somehow something that was always the case in Canada's history. That's why they have to emphasize Canada is a nation of immigrants. I mean, in fact, when you look strictly at immigration numbers, you could say that there was only one period of high immigration to Canada and it was during the Wilfrid Laurier years, from around 1896 to 1911, uh, you see high numbers of immigrants arriving, and you also see that they're arriving from places other than England or Ireland or Germany, because those three and Scotland were uh, the places from which high numbers came early on, besides the French, which were not that many. But um, so during the, the Wilfrid Laurier years, you see people coming. Uh, from the Ukraine and from Russia and from Scandinavia. So there's a bit of more diversity. Um, but before that, 
many of the immigrants that came in here actually immigrated to the United States. Right. So, right. yeah, and I point that out. I don't examine it as much as I should have, but I do point out that many of them immigra immigrated to the United States. So it really was all the fertility rate that was pro creating this nation. Uh, so this whole idea that we have always been an immigrant nation from the beginning is just simply historically inaccurate. It's just a way of taking away from Canadians that sense of pride, that sense of being rooted in this land. Well, they're stealing and, our history as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah, they, they are stealing the history. They are rewriting it, erasing it and condemning it. I mean, they're taking the statues down. Uh, I'm going to have an article that somebody else... Uh, send me, uh, it's a statement about uh, a statue of the founder of Halifax that is about to be pulled down. Uh, but I wanted to add another point that it's not just in the case of Canada that they're saying that they're immigrant nations. They now extended this idea to Germany, to uh, Britain, and to other European nations. They're saying they're all immigrant nations because people came from somewhere else. Uh, which is nonsense because in that case, every nation in the world is an immigrant nation since people kind of have moved around. Uh, but uh, what people need to realize is that if a people, like say the case of the British, if they have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years and have raised themselves there and established themselves there, they're rooted in that place. They're not immigrants. That term is being misused. Um, the truth of the matter is, and I bring these statistics in the book, is that most of the world's population uh, lives in the same place that they were born. It's upwards in the 90%. What is happening is that um, in terms of total numbers, they are, most of them are coming to the West. So we really feel this mobility, this migration of peoples. We see it because they're arriving here, but nobody's going to China. And even though many Chinese in total numbers are living as a proportion of their population, which is 1.2 billion, um, most of them are not living. They're staying there. So the Chinese are rooted in that land and they have been there generation after generation after generation. The same goes for the Germans and other Europeans. So to say that immigrants themselves, it makes no sense. It's a falsification. It's an attempt to deceive people. The one big concern that I have more than anything is how easily this is happening to many Euro Canadians who are multi-generational, who have lived here uh, for their entire lives. And what I'm seeing from them is that they seem to be accepting and are okay with this idea that Canada will no longer be a white majority based on the mass immigration numbers that we are seeing. And I'm wondering why we have this sort of suicidal cultural tendency or this self-hatred uh, to be okay with this because no other country in the world would really be okay with this. I mean, in Saudi Arabia, they wouldn't be okay with it. Japan, China, the list goes on and on. This is very unusual. Yes, in the last part of the book, uh, Spiraling Out of Control, I try to explain why it is that Canadians and Westerns generally have come to accept this kind of idea. And I'm not going to get in an explanation of that here because it's a long complicated explanation but it is something peculiar about western peoples and it's in part because of their individualism that has not allowed them to fully comprehend that when you create a nation you don't create a nation as in the sense that individuals as abstract units came together and agree to create that nation. It's not like Locke says that contractual arrangements of isolated individuals agreeing to create a nation based on certain values. That's not how it happens. Uh, the way it happens is the way it's happened in Canada. There is a process of colonization, a process of imposing yourself, making a living, struggling, surviving, uh, having conflicts with other people that are different and then defining yourself as a people with certain customs, a certain religion. And if you look at early Canadian history, they're always saying very early on, Canada is a British nation. That's Canada's heritage. And what they want to do is set 
cultural boundaries. That's what we are. The Quebecois are doing the same thing. So uh, this idea that they thought of themselves from the beginning as singular individuals that could come from anywhere else is not true. They thought of themselves as people coming from a particular background in the world that tended to be heavily British, uh, Christian, in the case of Quebec, Catholic, very French, but then like Quebecois because it grew in the soul of Quebec. That's a collective. That's a sense of we are a group, we are a nation, we are a people. Uh, but liberalism has this idea that, oh, well, no, we are just many individuals, each pursuing our own way of life, uh, each with our rights, and we are not, we cannot define ourselves as a, as a culture. And so this liberalism was radicalized and pushed by leftists who penetrated into the liberal worldview and sort of pushed it in a direction in which you strip Canadians of any collective cultural and ethnic identity. I mean, Pierre Trudeau did that. And this happened across the Western world, slowly and gradually. Any sense of ethnic cultural identity was seen as something that is potentially or already fascistic, mm -hmm. nasty, racist. You can't do that. If you really want to be a liberal, your country has to be open to the rest of the world. So one of the things I argue in my book is that no, uh, you can consistently be a liberal, you can believe in equality of rights, you can believe in separation of church and state, um, you can say that human beings should be free to pursue whatever career they want to, and that the educational system should be open to everyone, you believe in freedom of the press, all of those basic liberal values, you can believe in them, and yet at the same time say, but we are a people, we are a culture. It doesn't mean that it is very homogeneous or that it is pure, but give and take, you know, some diversity here and there because the aboriginals were here too, and some immigrants from other parts of the world had arrived, um, give and take that kind of diversity that is there, you can still say it is a people uh, uh, and, 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 and the minorities are assimilating and this is, a collective way of life. So that's something that I write a lot about in the book, and I think it's important to understand that don't let the left, the other side, make you feel that you're not liberal, you're not open-minded, you're intolerant. That's not true. All these values were created by Europeans, uh, and they were created. The values of tolerance, freedom of the press, were created by nations like Britain, very cohesive. I mean, they have the Welsh, they have the Scots, and they have slight ethnic variations, but these are historic minorities that have been there for generations. They're not newly arrived people coming out of nowhere from far away. They, they are clo very close genetically speaking. Uh, all these smaller groups within Britain or Scotland, which is a bigger group. So uh, it, it's important to be aware that liberalism was in many ways corrupted and stolen away from Europeans and turned into something that it, mm -hmm. it need not be. Uh, but it does have that weakness. It has a weakness to, to misunderstand um, the importance of a national collective background for the proper functioning of liberalism itself. Well, I think the left has done a magnificent job of one, infiltrating the universities, but also the media landscape. And it seems that anybody who has any sort of national pride or loves their culture but happens to be white is immediately deemed a white supremacist Nazi. And there's just no logic there. I mean, to go from somebody who cares about their culture and their history and to have pride in their race suddenly is some evil person that wants to kill other people. It just seems right. so unrealistic. Yeah, they, uh, after the Second World War, Western people became obsessed that any identification uh, of oneself as a member of a race is inherently, potentially, 
nasty and you're about to to run up people that look different from you and that's not true i mean the people who fought nazi germany canada included were liberal nations they did have uh, immigration restrictions because they fell i mean mckenzie king was very clear he said if we open our borders to asian immigration well the character of the nation will be radically transformed and you only have to go to Richmond, BC, and various other areas of Canada to realize it has been transformed. The language, in terms of that like you see in Richmond, BC, all over the place, is Chinese. Um, the sounds, the language that people are speaking around you when you go to restaurants, you go to public spaces, when you get into the bus, it's not English. Um, and 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 in, in many other ways, I mean, people have different mannerisms, expressions, and looks that do matter. The whole idea that it doesn't matter that you can change people and have Canada populated entirely by Asians, and you know that doesn't make a difference. That's just not true. It makes a difference. There are many things that make up a race and a culture, including simple or not simple, but things that you may take for granted, like facial expressions, the jokes people make, uh, the kind of things they like in life, uh, whether it is that they like national parks, that they like animals and they're for animal rights, that they really love their pets, um, the kind of songs they like, all these things make up a people and they matter. And just merging everyone together, creating that kind of mixture, like a mongrelized pie of cultures and races, they're all going to look alike. So wherever you go, uh, you're going to see a replica of Toronto or a variation thereof. And meanwhile, you also have these genetic multinational companies selling out their products, and they don't care. The more genetic you are, the more they like it. Um, this is another element that I, I explained that corporations do like that kind of world. They don't want people that are very rooted and that have peculiar tastes and they like their smaller, more ethnic kind of restaurants. They want fast food chains, uh, clothing chains uh, that meet a mass consumer audience. And with music the same, a kind of commingle of many musical styles. And I'm not saying that that in itself is wrong or that in some ways it was inescapable because modernity does, uh, Japan is very homogeneous and has its own peculiar ways and habits and accents and the things they teach in schools and universities, the books they read, the way they joke and they laugh is peculiar unto themselves. And they are refusing, just because their fertility rate is very low, uh, they are saying, well, there are other ways. You can either retire later or you can introduce automation and other ways. So, um, you know, the whole idea that modernization or globalization necessarily brings or should bring immigration is simply inaccurate. This is only happening in the Western world. Yeah, and it's interesting this this term of diversity which you you mentioned because you know people travel and they go to Japan or they go to China because they want to soak in the culture of those nations. Same reason why people would travel to Canada. But when you have this diversity, it's actually making everything the same. So everything we're losing our cultural identity and like you said you could go to France and you would have Muslims there you would have Muslims in London and suddenly we don't have the the cultural significance that we once had that social cohesion that once existed in those countries and you think to yourself well, why would I go travel to those places I'm just going to see the exact same right. output or outcome in my own backyard which leads me to the, my next question with you Based on your research, what do you think Canada looks like? You can only theorize. What do you think it looks like when it's no longer a white majority because we've never had that in the history of the nation? Are we well, talking balkanization? Are we talking about um, more enclaves? Because we're seeing enclaves now, especially in Toronto. You can already see what it will look like if you go to the big cities, right? Uh, Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto, and Calgary now. What will make a difference when you really witness whites reduced to a minority is that 
And already before that, there's going to be a lot of more pressure to change even things that you could not imagine could be changed. Um, I discussed this in the book that how we interpret multiculturalism will depend on the ethnic demographics of the nation. Um, right now, when you read books about how it is interpreted, it is very legalistic, and this is what this word means, and this word means that, and they do realize that when you look at the legal documents that talk about multiculturalism, whether it is the Charter of Rights or the Multiculturalism Act of 1988, uh, that it is implied there that it means that different ethnic groups don't just the members of those ethnic groups don't just have individual rights, but they have certain group collective rights to protect their culture and enhance it. It's already there. To your question, uh, in the future, I believe that they will make the most of it. They will say it really does mean that a culture can kind of quasi-separate itself and be autonomous from the rest of the culture. I mean, already indigenous peoples in those territories that they have, they have all kinds of separate powers. That's right. And it's it's like an apartheid state, really. Yes, and they are, have a right to identify themselves as members of an ethnic group, by the way, because if whites do that, they're total racist, but they are not. And so I see more groups doing that. But at the same time, there's going to be a lot of more racial mixing, which is going to create confusion. Uh, people that mix don't identify with whites. They tend to identify more with the other minority, which will not be a minority. But yeah, I mean, to me, it's a matter of demographics. Uh, the more people they are that are non-whites, the more they will make of multiculturalism and take it to its logical conclusion. Because the logical conclusion of multiculturalism is you have multiple cultures, and if you do, then why do you have a British parliamentary system? Isn't that just a British way of doing politics? Why can't we have another way of doing politics? Why well, we are seeing that in Britain. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We are seeing that in Britain. We have uh, Sharia courts there, and then they they tried yeah. to impose Sharia law here in 2005 in Ontario. So I completely agree with what you're saying. Yes. So expect more of that, uh, more assertion, more affirmation. All the so-called liberal multicultural theories of Wilkin Lika, they're going to go out the window because he thinks, oh, it's just a matter of giving them time to adjust to Canada. It's a question of giving them room to integrate and everybody's going to assimilate. And that's what happens after one generation or two. Well, the reality in the past was very different. Most of them were Europeans. And as I just said before, only during the Wilfrid Laurie years do you have mass numbers arriving. Uh, and never like you do now. Now, since the early 1990s, we have had continuously high numbers every year. So we are talking of a period like close to 30 years now. We never had 30 years of over 200,000 every year arriving in, a, in Canada. So it's a different reality that he has not thought about. And he, Kim Lika, is making a mistake if he thinks it's just a question of integrating one generation. No, it looks like it's a question of integrating every year large number of peoples who will see less and le reason to integrate to Canada because that Canada doesn't look like Canada. It looks like a nation of multiple cultures. What do what do we need to do to stop the flow of immigration? Do you think it is going to stop? Or do you think now that Canadians see this as part of their identity, as opposed to understanding what it really means? Like, is there a way that we can end this sort of globalist mentality of mass migration from the third world into Canada? Well, not in the near future. Uh, Justin Trudeau, as you know, uh, has been increasing emigration every year that has been in power above the Harper numbers, which were already very high. And there are people that are calling for 500,000 a year. So oh Trudeau, gosh. yes, uh, there's a book that came out just when my book came out. It's by Doc Sanders from the Global Mail. It's called Maximum Canada. And they, both books came out at the same time. And he says it there that, um, in fact, 
Canada can never be great and fulfill its dream unless it totally opens its borders to close to 500,000 per year so that the population... How is that sustainable in any sense of the word? He says it would make the country more affluent, get people get along better, <laughs> be dynamic Such culture. Bullshit. I know. I know. A lot of, um, and he says that they, and it's not just him, Century Initiative, if I recall, it's a group of people uh, that are, I wrote about this in my blog, um, that are saying the same thing that Canada needs to reach 100 million by the end of the century at least in order to fulfill McDonald's dream and Wilfrid Laurier's dream of creating a, a great Canada. So that's so, just the destruction of the entire nation state. Yes, it, well, it certainly will mean the destruction of Euro Canadians. They will disappear, they will be marginalized. Um, so, you know, to the question that you were asking, then in the near future, that's what I see. And I don't see that being stopped anytime soon. So what I think we got to do is that uh, whites need to affirm their identity. You have to play that kind of politics. Uh, Jordan Peterson and others don't want to do that, but they too are not living in reality. The notion that you can think of yourself as an individual, I mean, he's saying he doesn't like identity politics, that he rejects identity politics of the left and that the all right is doing the same thing as the left. Well, they're not doing the same thing as the left because the leftist identity politics is very different. It is about creating multiple identities on the basis of values and feelings, deconstructing larger natural identities, whereas the all right conception of identity is that nature already gives us certain group identities, one of which Peterson recognizes, which is that men and women are not the same. Uh, we have certain behavioral differences. So that, it, that itself is a, a kind of group identity because you say, I'm a man, so I belong to that group that has this X, Y, behavioral tendencies. I'm not a woman who has these older behavioral tendencies. So that means that you're not just an individual, you also are a male or a female. But you can add more to that. You can also say, I belong to this culture. And this culture, I take it in a deep, serious way. It means a certain history that is unique to them, language, customs, institutions, uh, heroes, way of life. And that gives me an identity. And I wish to preserve it as a group reality, as a reality that is larger than me. And then you can add race to that. You can say my whiteness is part of my identity. I don't create that, that's given to me. Now we do to some degree construct that. People get very confused and say, oh, well, is it constructed? Construction or is it biologically given? It's always a combination of both, but good constructions are those that respect what is biologically given, that you take that to be serious so that when you think of your white identity, you're not arbitrarily just making it up. You say, well, no, it includes certain biological characteristics and obviously there are cultural aspects to it as well. I do think that Euro-Canadians need to affirm their collective identity without fearing that that means they're going to obliterate their individualism, which is unique to them, by the way. So our individualism is paradoxical. Paradoxical. Our individualism is uniquely an expression of the collective identity of white Europeans. And so both can coexist together and they coexisted together for, for most of history. So when the libertarians react against that and say, oh no, we, we cannot play leftist politics, we don't want to be into collectivities, that's just fascism and all that, that's nonsense. You, you're going to lose. You, you cannot win this war when the Muslims are collective, the Chinese and Asians are collective, and you're just, oh, let's all be individuals. You're going to lose. That's mainstream conservative and that's why they always lose. That's right. I agree with you. And it's hard for me to accept that premise because for years and years I considered myself as an individual of one. But the truth is there has to be some sort of collectivism. There absolutely has to be. Yeah. What I'm finding, I just want to get your thoughts. This is my own theory. I'm starting to see it as a dog whistle racist call because it clearly means no white people. When somebody says we want something to be more diverse, they're not necessarily talking about 
um, Black, Asian, Hispanic, they're usually talking about coming into a white nation and making it more diverse, which means making it less white. What are your yes. thoughts about that word? That, that's exactly what is going on. If you walk into a classroom and the vast majority of the classroom, as is increasingly the case in Vancouver, is Chinese Asian, nobody says there's a lack of diversity. It's only when it's white. And there seems to be no limit. They kind of say the more diverse, better it is. What does that mean? The less white it is. So even if it is 50% white, they're still saying, well, no, diversity must keep going and no, more immigrants must keep arriving. So therefore, more of them means less white and that's what diversity means. So yeah, they're stuck in, in this way of thinking, which is anti-white, is actually racist. Another argument they're making is that racially mixed people are superior. It just There's something better about them. They're more sophisticated. They, they're cosmopolitan like whites are just parochial small town people you know they're a thing of the past we gotta get beyond that past you see this running around this theme increasingly that there is something old-fashioned backward about white people and i'm like this is just ridiculous because the europeans are the ones who created the modern world uh they created uh, most of the philosophies we have, all the inventions. The oh yes, most of them came from them. So this is all nonsense. But that's how they are talking. Why do you think whites are hated so much? Why do you think that there is this push to destroy our culture and our nations? Because it clearly seems to be a coordinated, orchestrated effort. That question can be answered at many levels. Uh, there are some people that don't hate whites. They're just incredibly naive, very brainwashed, and they just think that that's the good thing to do, that, that whites need to help others, uh, to do more for other people, that we have a lot. So there's some like that. But there are others that are not really naive anymore, I would say, and, and not even idealistic. They do have a dislike of white people. They think white people exploited the rest of the world. That that's how they became rich, because that's what they teach. They, the, the, the most um, popular explanation as to why Europeans modernize first is that they just impose themselves with their guns on the rest of the world. I examined this in my first book, and I refute that argument. It's not true at all. Uh, no, and so there are people who think like that and really despise and dislike what they did to the aboriginals as they interpret it. Um, then there are other people uh, that it's kind of weird, but it flows out of this egalitarianism that is also unique to white people, that sense of fairness, that sense that you should be kind and, and humanitarian towards others. There are some people that think it is not fair that whites created the best countries in the world and that they need to share it. They need to redistribute their nations, like give it away kind of thing. It's like socialism, meaning you don't give money or uh, welfare, you actually hand over your nation to other people in the world so that you make the world more equal. Right. This is absolutely ridiculous. It's, it is, because everywhere's going to go down, and greatness can never be achieved that way. No. So, yeah. Well, do, do they actually think that what, there is no white people anymore in the world, that there isn't going to be another racial group that's targeted for having more? I mean, where does it end? It's just such a ridiculous theory. It is. The, 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 the left is pathological. They are like children. They can't think straight. And the amazing thing is that these people are in our universities. Uh, they are they are in many ways the worst because they have been the most brainwashed and they can't think outside the box they created. The thing is, our side has to just speak out and be proud of their racial, ethnic, cultural identity and never give excuses or feel guilty about it because nobody else will respect you. They're going to mock you. I mean, the Asians, I know, are laughing. They're thinking, these people, why are they handing over their nations to us? The Muslims don't respect you. The Muslims respect strong people. They respect people who fight back. But obviously, they want to take what you're giving to them freely. So, yeah. The issue is not that we're in a war with Islam. That, to me, is a side-tracking. Side it's, it's, it's confusing people. We shouldn't be going to the Islamic world and telling them they need to become Western or that they issues between Western values and Islamic values, like rebel news does that all the time. That's not really what it's about. 
ultimately is because there is a vacuum. And the vacuum is that all peoples affirm their ethnic cultural identity, but only Europeans don't. And so they are leaving themselves open to be taken over by other people. And they're doing, doing it willfully. I mean, Justin Trudeau almost literally says foreigners are better. They should come yes. here. You got to counter that by saying, no, actually, I'm proud of who I am and my heritage and my people. And if they say, oh, you're white, yes, you're, I guess I'm white and I, I'm proud to be white. So what's wrong with that?